Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, I've been doing daily COVID check-in podcasts since the end of March, but I had one last episode remaining from the before time, and uh, and this is it. This one and last week's were both recorded on March 4th, 2020, when we didn't really know what was coming beyond the abstract notion of, of what a pandemic is. Even now, I, I kind of find myself sliding into the abstraction of, of looking at tables of figures on websites and and positive cases and testing ratios and, and deaths per million by state and ICU usage and my county versus other counties in New Jersey and my town versus other towns in my county. And, and I act like there's some sense or some answer there. But of course, the numbers don't add up to the lived experience. And and any model they help form is necessarily altered by our behavior and our knowledge that there is a model. Um, so on a micro level, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing, which is making podcasts. Even if I can no longer experience the, um, the joy of sitting across a table from someone I have never spoken to until that moment and finding an hour of conversation between us. So my guest this time around is the translator Alta L. Price. Alta is the co-curator of what was supposed to be the 2020 edition of the Festival Noi Literatur, which she pronounces so much better than I do. Um, FNL is a four-day festival bringing German language and U.S. fiction together. Each year, the... Um, the festival brings six German language authors, along with a pair of Americans, for panels, readings, and a great kickoff event in New York City. Um, and each year, I try to help promote the event by recording with the curators and authors, try to get as many in before the event, and then during that week, try to get some of the foreign authors so I can um, keep doing shows afterwards. This year's event was supposed to be this week, April 23rd to 26th in New York City, but it's been postponed to next year. Alta and her co-curator, last week's guest, Tess Lewis, uh, both told me they and their families are still safe and sound from coronavirus. And I'm hoping we get a chance to record a follow-up before next year's FNL. Maybe I'll repost these episodes as we get closer to the event and... Um, and we'll celebrate in some sort of way. As caveats go, not much, except a doorbell rings at one point. And here's Alta's bio. Alta L. Price runs ALP Consulting, a publishing consultancy specializing in literature and nonfiction texts on art, architecture, design, and culture. A recipient of the Goethe Kunst Prize, she translates from Italian and German into English. Her latest publications include books by Martin Mosbach and Dana Gregorsha, which I mispronounced, and her translations of Alexander Kluge and Anna Goldenberg are forthcoming in 2020. Her work has appeared on BBC Radio 4, Three Quarks Daily, Maharam Stories, Trafica Europe, Words Without Borders, and elsewhere. 
She is a member of PEN, the Authors Guild, the American Literary Translators Association, the Third Coast Translators Collective, and Sadia and Co. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Alta L. Price. It's an obvious opening question, but how did you get started in translation? How did I get started in translation? Yeah. It was a complete happy accident. Yeah. So I had, I was in, I was studying art in Rome. Mm -hmm. And so I had actually studied German, studied printmaking. I was aiming to go to the Gutenberg Museum in Mainz to do junior year abroad studying what I love, which is the history of books and the printed word and the diffusion of knowledge in the Western world. Um, through a happy bureau bureaucratic accident, I did not have a chance to go to Germany. I got sent to Rome. Uh, the Italian language of that... You, you didn't sleep on the plane and end up in the wrong place. Did not like, sleep did on you? the... Oh, <laughs> just making sure. <laughs> yeah, planes aren't quite like trains, although, yeah, I have some train stories too. But um, so I, I learned Italian and several years later... I was writing about art and art history and art criticism. I had done some informal translation for, you know, correspondence for friends, but certainly nothing for publication. And a, a friend of mine who's an interpreter, she primarily works as an interpreter, um, frequently for uh, opera singers, artists, politicians, working between Italian, French, and English. Her native language is Italian. So she called me up one day and she said, I, I have this huge project. And half of it is English into Italian, which I will do. But I have the other half of it, completely different essays from Italian into English. And I need to work with a, a great translator. And uh, at that time, I had, you know, she and I always spoke in Italian because we knew each other through Italian colleagues and friends. And she had read my art criticism. Uh, so I said, look, I have not studied translation. Um, but if you will take me under your wing. And she said, you know, I've read your writing in English. I know your level of Italian, and I know that you can do this. So I really thought it would be a one-off. I'd help my friend Maria, and that would be it. Um, it was an exhibition catalog, and I loved it. And I got credited on the copyright page, and it somehow inadvertently snowballed into a career. Mm -hmm. So, Was there a sense of, um, well, within the field, is there a sense of nobody really trains trains to become this you just do it and discover you're a translator well it's or? interesting i think that's shifting yeah. um the the older translators i know all had had at least one other career sometimes multiple careers before they really devoted themselves full time to translation uh and i think the idea being you know a love of language but also specific field knowledge right so yeah. i fell into translation through my background in the visual arts and art history um, now, but also at that time, I mean, we're talking 15, 20 years ago, there weren't as many programs. Now you can get an MFA in translation and literary translation. It's, and it's similar with other fields. You know, now you can get a PhD in, in studio art in some places. So there's a, a professionalization on the academic end that uh, we'll see. I mean, it's, it's Do shifting. Do you think that's useful? Um, I would, you know, had, I, I think it's certainly useful. Mm -hmm. I can't even imagine because it wasn't the path that I took, yeah. but also I couldn't have foreseen becoming a translator. Well, I mean, I, so. I record with a lot of cartoonists and the mm -hmm. older ones are like, it's great that there are now courses of study in this, but wasn't around. But none of them up, ever I, took one. Yeah, I would never think yeah. of, of having done something like that. I don't know what my work would have been like had I gone through a, an academic program for it as opposed yeah. to just making the art. Uh, and again, translation is different in, in that respect, but... Yeah, I have no idea. No, for me, I actually yeah. think a lot of it, there are so many parallels in creative fields. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's that age old discussion of, well, you can't teach talent. Um, some people have innate, innate gifts. Others, you know, you, you can learn. You can certainly learn foreign languages. You can perfect your own writing in your, in your native language or mother tongue. But um, I think there are just multiple paths and uh, those who are able to, I, I think it's great that there are, are translation courses now, courses of study. What did you get better at over the course of uh, 15, 20 years of translation? What do you look back at and think, oh, God, I can't believe I used to do or do it this way 
Is there any aspect of it that you can... Well, there are things I thought I would get better at, meaning speed, (laughs) Um, uh, fluidity. And, you know, I really view each book, especially each author, but each book as its own unique thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I I cannot say that I've gotten faster over all of these years. Um, I have learned ways to mitigate the doubt I think. And I think... And that's got to be useful anywhere in life as a guy crippled by anxiety and doubt. I'm, I'm yeah. what your key is. I mean, I, I have perfectionism that paralyzes me, right? And mm-hmm. so every almost every single sentence, every paragraph, I could think of another way to do it. Um, and I, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to call anyone out, but I did have a very formative informal mentor at one point and she said oh you know when i when i get my author copies of the books that i've translated i never open them you know she signs them but she doesn't open them and start mm-hmm. reading them because she will have that i think natural urge for a translator to start tweaking redoing it again it, or yeah. start redo it from the start i saw i, I, I think emily wilson's mentioned uh, her odyssey going from hardcover to paperback she redid oh she revised it yeah. oh i didn't follow that yeah i think i just saw it in the last day or two i'm, I'm hoping to mm-hmm. record with her this this summer mm-hmm. um, and i just thought okay again not my field but you know i've been working off a of Lattimore for well since i turned 17 18 when mm-hmm. i started with with those two although i i uh discovered earlier this year that um my Lattimore is going to be phased out for the iliad uh daniel mendelssohn is 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 he translating? No, he's translating the Odyssey. That's right. Lattimore's Iliad is sticking around. The Odyssey is going away. Mm-hmm. So, but that's know. also an interesting difference between translating, or if you want to say, retranslating classics versus working with contemporary literature. Which is another question I've got. Do you prefer <laughs> living or dead authors? Um, Do you consult with the living authors? It really depends on the author. Mm-hmm. I've had incredibly generous authors who love questions. Uh, I've had other authors who, depending on their uh, feeling of security in English will say, you know, you're the professional translator. I wrote what I wrote. The text is what it is. And I trust you to do what you will with it. Um, others who very actively want to be involved in the revision process. So, and, and it can be really fun. Hmm. Uh, I mean, it can be, sometimes it gets agonizing. Uh, but I have, I, I mean, I've worked with some authors who have since died, but, uh, I have not personally had the fortitude yet to take on a classic, mm-hmm. um, you know, a, a text that 20 some translators have already brought into English. I also feel as though uh, there is really something to bringing contemporary work into English, voices that otherwise might not make it mm-hmm. into English that have never been heard before uh, and, and that speak more to the moment. Is there a percentage split or just a general split between projects that you originate and ones that editors come to you with? How often do you pitch a a book that, you know, I would love to translate this versus, you know, an editor saying, we would love for you to translate this? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I do love data, except I'm terrible about compiling my own data, so I can't give you a percentage. Uh, In general, most of the work that I have had come into print and get into bookstores and into readers' hands have come to me through publishers or editors who've already acquired the rights. And they're either looking for the right fit or we happen to have had a conversation about this and somehow it, it, it congealed in the right way. I always have a list of dream projects. Unfortunately, my pitching season, if you will, is limited to, mm-hmm. you know, when I have time. Yeah. So I have uh, successfully placed a few pitches. Um, but it's it and it really depends. And I feel as though I mean, I'm surrounded by so many really amazing translators who have decades on me in terms of experience. And um, it's just it's inspiring, you yeah. know, so I don't necessarily feel I, I always feel this sense of urgency when I read something. And, and I just think this has to appear in English tomorrow because people need to be reading this. Uh, but, you know, publishing, especially um, what are we calling them? Legacy publishers now, publishers who still print on paper and, and bind books. I was going to say, did you get the Simon & Schuster news today? Uh, Simon no. & Schuster is apparently going to be sold off by Viacom because uh, there's really no video angle. Yeah. So they just figure, you know, it doesn't fit with our, our core competencies of 
yeah. shitty movies yeah. or TV. It's amazing. So yeah. so, yeah, there's this mixed sense of urgency, but also, oh, you know, not only will it take a long time to to hammer out a contract and figure out the best way to get this to an English language readership, but the actual act of translating itself, which mm-hmm. which takes time. Yeah. Again, the the first I think the first translator I recorded with was Anthea Bell. Mm-hmm. And, and every other translator I've spoken to, like, we don't understand how does she produce this many books? You know, I, she was amazing in her, her time. But yeah. yeah, I have no idea. I did pitch Pivir and Volk- uh, Volokonsky once, but they... Um, mm-hmm. They felt they would just talk too loosely on mic and, mm. and just wouldn't make for a good interview. I was like, I'm glad you recognize that about yourselves. Mm. So don't don't worry. The idea that they'd be you know too loose with language is. I saw issue them at the New York but... Public Library a few years ago, and I, I it was fun. It was so great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I went into that talk not having read. I forget which one they were talking about, but I remembered my ninety something year old grandmother at that point saying because she'd read Anna Karenina with her book group and I asked her I said well which translation are you reading and she you know she went and she said I don't remember but well they really they not knowing who she was talking about whoever it was who translated this new version of Anna Karenina that that her book group was reading she said they ruined they ruined Anna Karenina my favorite line from (laughs) that is still the translation I think it's by the mods by uh, Louise and Albert Maud. It's it's the first mm. time uh, Levin sees Kitty uh, when they're out skating. And it's something about, um, God, I saw her the way one sees the sun without looking, but seeing. And mm. I went off and hunted down every other translation. Everybody wrecks it. Everybody either goes too literal or it's too obtuse and you can't figure it out. And, and Pavir and Volokonsky is very literal, but doesn't have the the beauty of, of the moment. But yeah. But they also yeah. have a very specific mission, as I understand it. You know, they want to bring the roughness, and I don't yeah. speak Russian, but, you know, bring the roughness of the original Russian into English. And I think, I think my, I'm sure almost certain my grandmother was comparing it to the Constance Garnett version, yeah. which is a whole different entity. Right. Um, so it was great that she loved that book, and it was great she was able to experience that book in a version that she did not love. It was, you know, in a way it was the same book, but it was... A completely different book at the same time, which speaks to the heart of what translation is. Do you have a mission? Do I have a mission? The way you describe that one with a uh, uh, Pavir Volokonsky. Oh, and, and obviously, to... yeah, that's an overarching take for the wow. entire project. But do you see yourself, do you see a recurring trend or anything weird about, uh, you know, uh, um, about the way you you work? Mm. Well, I think it's slightly different, and it's interesting. Tess might also have some something to say about this because she, Tess works from German and French, and I work from German and Italian, and there is some overlap between those languages. But the both the the literary history and the cultural the cultural dynamics are very different. Mm-hmm. So I can't say that I'm trying to bring a specific aspect of, and, and also, um, Pavir and Volkonsky are, uh, wait, Volkonsky? Volokonsky. Volokonsky. Well, he's, I, I'm remembering the count. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a very specific, a very select narrow set of authors in mm-hmm. a time period. And, you know, I, I don't at this point, maybe in a few decades, I'll have more perspective on that. Yeah. But I think it's also, and that's one of the things that's exciting about Festival Noi Literatura is that there are both more experienced authors who have several books out. And then there are some authors who, a couple of whom are not necessarily um, did not grow up speaking German and are now mm. writing in German. Um, so, I mean, the short answer to your question is no, I don't have a mission other than bringing these Great voices books. into English. Yeah. 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 Tell me about the festival and your, not just this year, but your involvement with it over the years. Mm-hmm. So my involvement started out uh, as an attendee. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, what a bizarre thing that there's a literary festival for German language literature and that they bring these authors over. So I went to several uh, events, never attended every single one in retrospect now wishing that I had. (laughs) Um, But, and so last year was it, yeah, 2019 was the, and I was not officially on the docket 
I sort of snuck in the back door, I guess, in in a way very similar to how I got into the translation world. One of my authors uh, and her recent novel um, in my translation was chosen for the festival last year. So she was going to be on stage. And this is uh, Dana Grigorcha. Uh, and she's one of those authors who's incredibly generous and likes to... She really enjoyed talking about the translation process. Um, we had, I hadn't, you know, I had sent her a draft of the first few chapters and um, she'd made some observations. So she grew up in Bucharest and lives in Zurich now, it publishes in German. Um, and she talked about her experience of being translated into Romanian and certain things that I'd done in certain sentences and her seeing parallels between decisions the Romanian translator had made and decisions I was making of bringing it, bringing it into English. Um, I feel like I just keep digressing all the time, but that's also what I do. Oh, that's the nature it, of the show. As now, I the translate, whole, yeah, the I go down these rabbit this. holes. Yeah. <laughs> but so last year, because uh, Dana Grigorcha was involved um, – and it happened to coincide. She was part of the festival, but her publisher and with the help of Pro Helvetia was sending her on a five city book tour in the U.S. So we had actually done a couple of book launch events on the West Coast before she came. She then we yeah, we did San Francisco, Seattle, Chicago, and then it culminated in the Festival Noi Literatura. And I and I didn't expect to be involved. I expected to be a very enthusiastic audience member. Um, but you know, she wanted to do some readings. Somehow I ended up on stage doing some of the readings. I think she didn't want to read the English. Oh, um, okay. But she also was very generous in terms of crediting translators. And, you know, not not every author, every publisher, every festival organizer necessarily um, Credits. Or, yeah, recognizes, yeah. Yeah. you know. And, and I completely understand as it was, you know, she's the rare author who kept talking about our book. Um so, yeah, that's that's how I got involved. And then uh, it's it's just such a miracle to me that this festival is in its 11th year and still going. Uh, you know, it's something that because I translate from both uh, German and Italian, it's like, oh, I wish the Italian. Yeah, I was going to ask, us. is there anything, I really wish. anything similar or is it something you would look to uh, look to launch or organize? I would love to. Mm -hmm. There's actually a really remarkable uh contemporary author named Claudia Durastanti. She's not, I, I'd have to, I have to check. Um, I know that there, her, her recent memoir is under contract. It'll be coming out with Riverhead at probably next year, um, in a translation by Elizabeth Harris, but I read the original and she's organizing, I'm forgetting the acronym. It's a, an Italian literary festival in London. So, uh, I guess the flip is with German, at least you have those multiple countries. Exactly. Where it's Italian, really a question yeah. of even Italians of, don't all speak Italian. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very, that's a whole other podcast episode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, again, I was just wondering in those terms of, of having something like FNL out there that, that, you know, Oh, it would be a dream. Yeah. It would be a dream, but you know, it's also, um, and I'm, I'm constantly torn both, you know, earlier today I was at the Armory Art Fair, which just opened, you know, I still have, I'm still very active in, in the art world, the visual art world and the literary arts world. And it's, it's a question of just, I hate using the term bandwidth, but it's the best one I can yeah. think of, of really, you know, and when it comes down to it, I, I always have to look at what will give me more time and space to translate, mm -hmm. to, to have more books. You know, reach what English. was your your literary upbringing and mm. relation to your your visual art? My literary oh. upbringing. Books were my first drug. I mean, mm. I I'm the child of two professors, but um, what the, hard, the hard sciences, okay. biology, evolutionary biology, um, anatomy, pre med. Um, so there. But I, I grew up just reading, I remember. And I think because I grew up in a small, um, small liberal arts college town. Which one? Uh, Clinton, New York. Okay. Hamilton College. Gotcha. Yeah. So I knew there was a broader world out there. 
but I didn't. And, and we, you know, I was very, very lucky growing up in that we traveled a fair amount. But, you know, I did not grow up in New York City. I could not walk out the door and go to an independent bookstore and have authors from all over the world reading. And now you can't um, anyway. I'm just kidding. Because New York, you know. <laughs> I, it's, yeah. it's the, there's still some, some oases. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's since moving to Chicago from New York, I've been really impressed at the indie bookstore scene, mm -hmm. but you know, it all comes back to, you asked about my literary upbringing. I remember buying used new, Hans Magnus Enzensberga. And this is embarrassing because I don't remember the translator, <laughs> but it was a bilingual edition of his poetry and it must've come out late fifties, early sixties from new directions. And I got to rampage through their, their, their shell, their giveaway shelves after recording with Barbara Appler once. Yeah. I, like, I get to take all this is literally this giant. Their office is stuff. such a portal. I mean, I love, they still have some of the, the matrices from the early, you know, cover printings yeah. and it's just a treasure trove, but that was really, it was a portal for me. I mm. mean, Jorge Luis Borges, all, you know, it was, and I, I remember New Directions, there were of course other publishers, but, and that was at the little, you know, my local library every year had a, a used book sale to support their programs. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Hamilton College was there with a very strong liberal arts program and all of these uh, literature and, and foreign language professors, uh, great books would just sort of show up on the village green. And that brought me these other worlds. Um, and then the visual arts side and the visual arts side, you know, I just, I loved drawing as a kid. My parents sent me to every summer art camp they could thinking that I would then wise up to the fact that visual arts was not a great life choice. <laughs> <laughs> and someday I'll be a teacher here at this camp for liberal arts. Uh, yeah. And I <laughs> fell in love, with, you know, but so I ended up going to art school. Um, I, I think they thought, you know, We'll send you to these these art these summer art programs, and you'll get to do art. And then, you know, very well intentioned um, and incredibly supportive. But I, th without saying it, I think they they felt like a creative life is a challenging life sure. on many on a material I've level. Done three hundred and fifty plus of these. I can attest to that. Yeah, beginning to end with yeah. these guys. Yeah. yeah. But the interesting thing is that some of the kids that I met at those summer art camps, I'm still friends with, mm. and they're still making art. Many of them are multilingual. Do they Many get you up them... for money? I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> 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 they share with me their own creative endeavors. The first time I found Kickstarter was through some of them. You know, they had projects on Kickstarter. Mm. I thought, well, what is this? And now mm. it turns out Kickstarter has an entire publishing program. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just – it's. Yeah, I don't know if any of this is making any sense outside of my head, but to me, it all makes sense somehow, yeah. um, especially with visual arts. I mean, sitting here, see, seeing this picture of, of Roz Chast, I mean, her. So she's combining a very unique visual style with her her great distillation of the language of her parents or her friends and the anxieties of parenthood and uh, that. You know, there are parallels between the visual and the verbal and the the auditory. And so to me, anytime you're taking an idea and someone would argue that as soon as you speak a sentence or, or write something on paper, you're translating because whatever it is in your head, in order to share it with others or express it, it has to be translated. So go moving from one medium to the other. I do think uh, studying printmaking gave me... I, it, the, again, no specific thing that I can grab onto, but this idea that um, you're getting at the core of what is a work of art? What is it doing? What does it do to you as a viewer or a reader in this specific medium? And can it do that same thing or something similar in a different medium? And is this like the, the Benjamin thing also, with the, the, the mechanical reproduction aspect and aura? It could be. Of a work of art. I mean, I think with the printmaking aspect. I mean. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I guess the direct parallel for me is that, uh, I mean, and again, in the Western tradition, not, you know, yeah. printing being, you know, coming from the Far East, a very different tradition, but reproductive printmaking in the West was um, 
you know, you have this masterpiece, whether uh, it's a sculpture or a great painting. But back in the days when people couldn't just easily hop on a train or plane or travel and see this work, if they couldn't afford to go on a grand tour, they could maybe afford to buy a print or a book of reproduction. So the idea being that the prints were supposed to bring that culture, that knowledge to someone who couldn't go there. And I think it's very similar with, with words and literature and literary voices. And translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, woodcuts, you know, a, a woodblock print versus a Buren engraving versus a mezzotint versus, I mean, I can like geek out about printmaking, etchings, mm -hmm. aquatints, uh, silkscreen. They all, uh, there are ways of producing an image, but the limitations of the specific technique or form or matrix affect what that print looks like. Mm -hmm. and, in a similar way, I would argue that, you know, German can do certain things that this gets English can't. Hegel's mistranslation of Goethe from the elements of the philosophy of right, <laughs> where he says uh, to be great, one must limit oneself, mm -hmm. uh, which is apparently a, a mistranslation of Goethe. But we let Hegel get away with it because, you know. Because he's Hegel. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, but that's certainly been the working within the con confines of whatever the, the medium is, much less, mm -hmm. you know, uh, limiting your ambition, which I've could take us on another podcast completely about my anxieties and depression, but that's neither here nor mm. there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that sense that the, the, the medium itself is defining some aspects of the art. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Whether you want to call it finding workarounds or, you know, and there, uh, I, I had the great fortune while still living in New York to be part of this, uh, informal translation group, um, led by Barbara Harshov, and she's one, you know, she translates from multiple languages and she's a great supporter of emerging translators or translated translators in all parts of their careers. Um, and the great thing about that workshop, and I'd heard about it through fellow translators, was that the idea is it's a group of translators. There isn't necessarily um, any one. The only common language between all of us is English. So. We're bring you bring pieces that you're working on, and you workshop it. But you don't send the text to print version in advance. You mm -hmm. you show up and you read it to everybody, and it was just such a breakthrough for me. Yeah, because I got to you know, and translators can recognize. I don't like the term translationese, but it's you know. Yeah. I think we all, as readers, we all know it when we read it or when we see it. It's oh, that doesn't quite sound right. Um, you know. Were they talking about a doorway or a portal or a threshold or, a, you know, all these different um, getting at the nuances? And there's nothing like having a group of people working from, you know, all these different languages to say, oh, maybe it could be this or maybe that. And Or is there the question of why did you choose this word? Absolutely. Okay. Like, is yep. this something that's, yep. you know, you're stuck with because of the, the, yeah. the source code? And it was helpful for me to to, to hear fellow translators say, yeah, I tried out all those other options that you all thought might sound better, but it really has to be this because, and there's a backstory, mm -hmm. you know. So. I translated Attic Greek many, God, decades ago now. Um, back when I was I was doing the whole Western books mm -hmm. thing. And uh, yeah, that was realizing what some of the, the choices were for the more uh, accepted translations. Like, but that's not what the Greek actually says. And when it comes to Plato, mm -hmm. you really sort of need to get that accurately. I yeah. Guess. But, um, with with a, a translation group like that, are there ever instances where you find out somebody's working on a project and it's just, oh, my God, thank God it's you and not me? Like, just that, you know, they're, oh, my God, that would be a nightmare to, to translate better you than, than me. It, it, does that sort of thing come up at all? Or is it uh. just a everybody's supporting everyone. I know that's, that's no, know. It, well, it's, it's constructive criticism. Yeah. Right. And, and some people bring texts, you know, uh, I, let's see, I was bringing, I was bringing more, I think some of my dream projects that weren't, I, you know, I wasn't that I wasn't necessarily working toward a deadline on, mm -hmm. um, and that I felt needed help. The other interesting thing about that group, I would say is that you know, certain pieces, like actually I started workshopping the Dana Grigorcha, an instinctive feeling of innocence in that group. And it really helped me understand because I'd, I'd translated, I'd done several drafts 
I'd seen it on paper, but when you go to read it, it becomes something else entirely. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that some books, you know, are born as books. <laughs> and, you know, if you end up speaking with Emily Wilson, this, the, the idea of the oral tradition, oral histories, what, what, what sort of literature is grounded in the spoken language versus the literature that was born on the page and maybe best exists on the page can be very difficult to read out loud. So with Grigorsha, it helped me because, you know, both bringing it over from German, but also her grounding in Romanian culture. It was like subclause within subclause within subclause. And some of them in the dra in my drafts were really unwieldy. And it was like picking apart. I remember thinking one day it was like, you know, when you ride a motorcycle, if you have long hair and, and you're riding a motorcycle, you get off and you take your helmet off and it's like you have to untangle the hair first before you can rebraid it. It's it's just it was this, you know, there were these knots and it was not working. Um, and that group helped. So, but there, you know, there was a Russian translator where the pieces were absolutely fun, but lots of times it was heavily influenced by surrealism. And I just thought, wait, 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 where, right. how did we Am get I missing here? Something did here or is that did I, did yeah. I, did I miss an essential section because I wasn't able to follow it? Mm -hmm. But, and that, you know, people were bringing, a, um, Jeremy Tang, a, a Chinese translator was bringing theatrical pieces and that's a whole different approach to sure. reading. And um, so just, yeah, it's a very mixed bag. And I think, yeah, no one ever said like, oh, don't translate this or, you know, yeah. give up now. Or just, you know, better you than me. Like, oh, thank God you got that project. I'm, yeah. 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 You mentioned the dream projects a few times. Is it, are there any you would mention or is it something you'd rather not reveal because there are things you're afraid somebody's going to grab? Or are they dream projects because nobody on earth would think to grab them? It, 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 it's, uh, yeah. I don't have so much fear of anyone grabbing them. I mean, I've so I've published a few excerpts of of work by this really uh, a Swiss writer who's um, from Ticino and writes in Italian, um, which is you know a lot a lot of German and French Swiss comes over, but not um, the Italian Swiss. Uh, Matteo Terzaghi is writing fabulous work. But I mean, interestingly, an, an excerpt of from his latest essay collection was uh, published in a in I think it was is it twelve Swiss books by by another translator. So mm. I'm not. I mean, of course, I do feel I Friday. feel kinship mm. and connection, and certainly there are authors I've worked on where uh, I once I I'm in a work, I feel so connected to it. But I don't feel as though I have a right to say that nobody else can take it on. Mm -hmm. But that's another thing that's interesting about the dynamics. Maybe just maybe it's not interesting <laughs> the of of publishing dynamics, you know, of how things do happen in English. So with with work where um, sometimes, you know, if I've pitched a book I or if a tran if any translator pitches a book, I would think, you know, the idea is they're pitching it because they think it should exist in English and they they feel strongly enough. And if it's if they've read the original and they work in that language pair, mm -hmm. they would want to do it with that press. I think sometimes presses acquire the rights to work that they can't necessarily read. Um, they're going on reader reports from other translators who may or may not have passed up on a project or give an opinion, but maybe there isn't time in their schedule. Um, you know, how these projects actually come about. So, uh, and it's interesting looking at, I, so uh, one of my forthcoming books from German, uh, is by Alexander Kluge, who's been translated by many different mm -hmm. translators. Uh, one of whom I was recently in touch with and she said, Oh, you're translating Kluge, which ones, you know, I do that occasionally, but you know, there's a difference between his writing about cinema, which is most of what's been published in English, uh, versus his what what he's calling stories that are really, um, would we call them creative nonfiction? Probably, probably creative he's nonfiction. One in of English. my most hated terms. <laughs> <laughs> I, I has, that's what would novel, we call but, it? Yeah, yeah. autofiction. It's always you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
But it's, and that's the fun part. And that's where I, I, I'm so grateful to be a translator instead of a marketing, you know, I mean, there is a marketing aspect to it, but I, I really struggle to put labels on things and, and the, the, the publishing industry that exists in this country, you have to label it. You have to, you know, the, the booksellers have to be able to turn it over and see that category on the back. You know, is it, is it self-help? Is it Mm. memoir? You know, what's the difference between a, a memoir and an autobiography or, you know, and, and whose, whose autobiography goes in literature, in the literature section versus, you know, these categories. That's, that's, yeah. Um, prefer translating German or Italian? I love them both. Okay. So there's no no Sophie's Choice thing where, you know. Not at all. So what's interesting is that I studied German for much longer than I studied Italian, but because I lived longer in Italy, I just have a very different relationship to the language. So, uh, but I will also say, um, and I hope none of the, I, I don't think I'm sharing any top secrets. Um, the, the Germans, the German speaking countries are better at providing funding mm-hmm. for their culture. Um, in a way that, I mean, I think Italy does, but given the, the nature of the politics and the state over there, sure. um, they don't have as much firepower and it makes it harder. You know, if a U.S. publisher, they see that translation as an, as an extra line on their profit and loss statement. So they feel as though it's already costing them more to translate a book. Uh, and who's going to pay for that? You know, and, and it's a, it's a real dynamic and it, it comes out in what, what we see come into English. And I, I'm really grateful that a lot of I have a lot of fellow translators from other languages. I don't like it. I people refer to small languages to me that what they you know fewer speakers. Yeah, right. But, so not. Uh, but you, languages you that, but to again, me are all the same size. Yeah, you right? take Norway if, if and all languages... of a sudden you've got this giant giant crime uh, world that that's getting translated when it's really not that huge a population. Right. But, yeah. Right. Well, they ha- they have the the economic wherewithal to to yeah. help that come across into Hmm. into the american the u.s marketplace um whereas i know a translator she i can't i mean it's shocking to me and yet also not shocking that the first malagasy uh novel was translated into english just a few years ago Hmm. um from french i mean it was published in french but a french translator working because she lived in madagascar so um these these dynamics affect and i'm very conscious as you know it's a relative luxury to work in german and italian even though i complain about italians not funding it as well um you know there are there are countries and languages that cannot afford to underwrite it and and it's just a shame is there such a thing as a definitive translation i would say no okay. well definitive how are you using the word definitive well, that's why I, I, <laughs> that's why i'm throwing it at you <laughs> How do you define definitive? So, yeah. I mean, and, and it, this is, it's, it's a cognate. Definitivo just means final, right? So to me, final is when I've sent it off and, you know, I'll go through the proofs before it goes to press. But once I get the bound produced book, that to me is definitive. Mm-hmm. Now, if someone decide if, if, if that book is worth retranslating in 40 years because slang has changed, then that will be the new definitive version. Mm-hmm. I guess the other term we use is what authoritative. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did an architectural history book once where I would say maybe half of the original author's works had been translated every single one by a different person. He had to some extent invented his own language. It was that it was very yeah. highly philosophical. So each of these translators over the course of 30, 40 years had made different decisions and and I just gave the the managing editor of the series a heads up. I said, you know, I'm going to uh, refer to these originals, and then for the works, the extended quotes in this that have not been translated, I will translate those. But this is going to need a real editor to tie this all together so that it makes sense in English. Mm-hmm. Unless we want to just throw out those previous previously definitive authoritative versions for the sake of this this new book that's a collection of his writings and criticism on them in many ways, but will really be a, uh, 
a pastiche isn't the right word, but it, it could have risked seeming like that in English if it hadn't been sort of smoothed over. And that's a thing that was not even an issue in the Italian one. You know, yeah. the Italian, they had all the excerpts from him and then they had the commentary by the author of this of this new work. Whereas in English, I, I couldn't, you know, it, it had appeared in English. So people were familiar with his work. Yeah. Um, but it depended on which person, which, which essay they read. Which and, they read, yeah. when, uh, and, and what their interpretation of that was. It was a little like the, um, on a bigger scale, when... when uh, I think I started in the UK when they read it Proust a few years ago mm. and had a different translator for each volume. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay. I'm right, saying, we, oh, I'm, we're looking up right now. Do we have them in all here? here? No, this is the complete works of Primo Levi. Yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to interview Anne Goldstein at some point, uh, along with her collaborator on a. Neapolitan Chronicles for a Jenny vessel. McPhee. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, we keep having the, yeah, we need to get together. And it's been a year and a half and I, I keep screwing it. Yeah. Which ties back to a question of mine because I frequently let those things lapse. And then I discover at the end of the year that I've generally interviewed three men for every woman who mm -hmm. I've, I've recorded with on this show. And this is the year that I'm really pushing to, to make sure I get some better gender balance on this. Mm -hmm. Tell me about gender issues within both the translator world and the what works get translated. I know you've you've been in that space. I know it's a light question to throw at you. At this yeah, point, but yeah, but yeah. Tell me about you know what the work you've done within. It's a movement. Yeah, it's called the Women in Translation movement. Um, and amazingly, there is now, thanks to the University of Warwick in the UK and several translators there, and. Uh, I, you know, I can't name them all, but I know Katie Derbyshire, who translates from German and is based in Berlin, was very active with this. But really looking at the discrepancies and saying, um, so my involvement in that movement, this is a this is a decentralized sort of do it yourself movement that many different translators are and editors are taking their own approach to, but, um, I've been working with Margaret Carson who translates from Spanish. Her most recent book, uh, is, Oh, I will botch the title. Um, Oh, sorry. I'll come back to it. I'll put it when in it show notes back. afterwards. Yeah. 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 Um, surrealist, uh, Oh, it, this is going to kill me. It'll, it'll come back to me at some point. <laughs> I, it's a problem when you go to a bookstore right before you come to. Yeah. <laughs> I stopped at a bookstore on the way, and I'm just my head is this mush of all these things that I want to read. Um, well, for me, it's usually the problem right before a trip. Yeah. Oh, in terms of looking reading. at your shelves and figuring out what you're going to take with you. Yeah. Because it can get paralyzing. Yeah. yeah. So Margaret Carson, who translates from Spanish, um, you work with her on Remedios Varo. There it is. Okay. Remedios Varo, who was a surrealist and um, and painter, and also did a lot of writing. So, um, I want uh, it's I want to say it's Wakefield Press. I wouldn't want to have gotten that name wrong. Again, I'll link to it in the yeah. Notes. I think it's Wakefield Press. I had the so, same thing trying to remember the lead singer of Judas Priest a couple of days ago while we were driving. Uh, yeah, uh, it took about fifteen twenty seconds before the name suddenly came to then me, which comes. was a sign that yeah. you know my my mind hasn't rotted too it's much. Intact. It's intact. It's just ish. Yeah, yeah. yeah ish. Anyway. So Margaret Carson, I who I had met through the Pen Translation Committee, um, basically for the Pen World Voices Festival in two thousand fifteen. She and uh, she would probably have a lot to say. I don't know how she initially got involved in the women in translation movement, but uh, I had met, I knew her through the pen translation committee and she had organized a panel as part of the pen world voices festival with some of the authors who pen was already featuring in the festival. But we thought, um, and you know, it was her initial idea. And then she invited me to be co-moderator, which was such an honor and we had Rob Spillman from Tin House. We had um, one of the count directors at Vida, which is Women in the Literary Arts. They do not specifically deal with translation, mm -hmm. but they've been doing – They every single year, it's Vida, V-I-D-A. Um, they release the Vida count, and they're really looking at, at – um, Is it the reviewers or the books that get reviewed? I forget. Or is it both? They're looking at bylines. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, they look at New York Review of Books, New York Times Book Review. They do pie charts. They give 
you know. Trust me, this is why I keep a gender list of, of my guests every calendar year. So yeah. I can, wow, Gail, this is the worst year ever for you. And, and yeah. you make excuses. Well, so but, in 2015, yeah. when Margaret invited me to be part of this, I thought, yeah, of course, naturally. And then I looked at my own bibliography and every single book had been written by a man. Yeah. And it, it honestly it it creeps never up on occurred you. to me. Yeah. The, you know? Those things creep up on you. I, the same thing. I went two years without a non-white guest. Mm-hmm. Didn't didn't notice. And then I look around and I realize a non-white person looking at my list of, of guests when I pitch them is going to say, that's a nice white podcast you have there, Gil. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. not part of this. Luckily, I, I got a very militant black cartoonist on board after mm-hmm. that. And, and that really kind of helped balance out through sheer intensity. But then from there yeah. on, I started doing a better job of just trying to get out of my silo and, yeah. and look out of my, my you know. Yeah. Very white world. So the exciting, th- I mean, that panel was so, and I, I, you can still see the entire, there's a video of the entire thing. It was at Albertine Bookstore, which was so generous of them. So, you know, a French centric, Franco centric bookstore. Um, I think Susan Bernofsky was on that panel. Definitely. She was great. She, you know, she, so she heads the, um, I believe it's the MFA program in literary translation at Columbia University. Mm-hmm. So she's doing a lot of really great advocacy work for the translation world, um, but also looking at the, this issue of women in translation. So in a nutshell, um, without having the statistics in front of me, I do very much remember that back in 2015, when we did this initial conversation, um, we were looking at roughly 26% percent. So if you want to take that 3% figure that I don't, I'm not sure how accurate that is anymore, but, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the the 3% blog from the university of Rochester. They're, they're basically trying to track, uh, the percentage of books published in English each year that originate in another language Mm -hmm. and came up with this 3% figure. I'd like to think that we're inching it higher every year. Um, Again, I'm not a statistician, but so of the 3% of books published in English each year that originate in another language, which means they're, they're coming to us through translation and through the work of translators um, of that 3%, roughly 26% were by female authors. Mm -hmm. That's without even looking at the translators. Then there's the anecdotal part of if you go to the American Literary Translators Association Conference or if you go to ATA, the American Translators Association Conference, um, you know, you see who you see and it seems like a pretty even balance. But then you look at what's being published. And again, in terms of, you know, uh, who's translating who? So that I ha- we have seen a shift in over the past four years. Um, there are more men boldly going where men weren't going before, um, men translating women mm-hmm. <laughs> into English. Um, and, it, you know, this actually came up during Ferrante fever when, yeah. um, when people were speculating as to who is, who is Elena Ferrante. And there were people saying, oh, well, you know, in this, this sex scene, only a woman could write that or... Only a man could have written such and such and, you know, these binary distinctions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But that, to me, that's the beauty of literature. It's like imagination. You, you think that oh, hmm? imagination, imagination. I mean, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know. I would never say. I mean, I've had some really surprising one of the Italian authors I've translated, Gabriele Pedula, uh, you know, I noticed most of the protagonists of his short stories were female and it never it never felt awkward to me i never thought oh this you know he's he's botching the female experience i mean he'd written these short stories that really spoke to me and i enjoyed them hmm. and i i had a blast bringing them into english so um but there are so many i mean uh, i i don't know how much time you have oh. <laughs> uh, the, the, one of the yeah, big cool. one of the big things we talked about in the this the, in, in the pen world voices festival um veronique tajo was also um was also part of that so she's been translated from french um but this idea of the gatekeeper right okay so we okay we've identified that Okay, we're getting this certain amount of literature from the rest of the world, from the non-English speaking world into English. Who's it coming from? Who are we paying attention to? 
looking at that, okay, who are we not paying attention to? Who are we not hearing? Um, we had a follow-up panel at, uh, I mean, it's, so the Alta conference, not named for me, named for the American Literary Translators Association. But you can pretend. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's the one conference where no one ever forgets my name. Um, had a follow-up panel, I think the, the next year with an editor at a small indie press. And she really had no problem saying, we choose our authors based on us. Our house has a certain aesthetic. And it just turns out that, you know, writing by women doesn't really fit that aesthetic. Okay. And what are you going to do? Okay. She believed that. Yeah. Um, maybe in 20 years she won't. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question, but it also gets to the heart of identity, right? And who, so. It's, it's funny because I recorded with Otto Penzler a couple of weeks ago. He owns a mysterious bookshop and, mm -hmm. and has a mystery presses, uh, that, that he runs. And he, he admitted, he's like, you know, people come into the store and you think they're going to want one thing. And it turns out, you know, especially when you gender profile, he said, it turns out like, I'd see men going and buying Agatha Christie and women buying some of the most hardcore, you know, crime Jim Thompson type stuff. And yeah. I'm like, huh, that's not the way things were when I was young, but I'm so glad yeah. you know, all those identities don't hold up anymore. Exactly. But, Isn't yeah. that wonderful? So, but I mentioned that editor because of this gatekeeper idea, right? So you start talking to editors or publishers and they say, well, we're not all of them. I mean, there's some that are very activist on this front, but, um, Certain editors, Margaret and I ended up speaking to, would say, well, because we don't speak all these languages, we have to rely on what the foreign publishers are proposing to us. You know, we go to the Frankfurt Book Fair, we're looking to buy some rights to, and, 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 and I completely get where they're coming from. They say, we have a limited budget and we can only afford to do X number of books in translation each year. And we can only choose from what, what these foreign publishers present to us. But, you know, implicit in that statement is uh, it's the foreign publisher's fault. Yeah. So then you get into cultural dynamics and, okay, you know, well, and that's a whole other, you know, another, we need to recruit some statisticians for this for in various countries what's being published. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, and Margaret and I have tried a little bit to focus also um, luckily with some of the prizes in translation or, you know, long lists and short lists for, for literature and translation. It's, I, I, I love those because then we can look at, um, and see the, see the numbers shifting women who will, you know, translating women, men, translating women, 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 translating men, women, translating women. Um, again, you know, I, I was hesitant at first. I thought this whole binary thing and, yeah, aesthetically, I just want great literature to to speak for itself. But it just turns out that a lot of it can't speak for itself hmm. when structurally we, things are. Yeah. 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 It's skewed. Hmm. So it's just something to be conscious of. And uh, so Rob Spillman's contribution to that panel was really helpful because he's an editor who's uh, at the time. Tin, ha Tin House is still doing books. I don't think I don't know that they're doing the journal anymore in print. I hope they no, are, but I, I feel they, like they aren't. They shut down something major. Yeah, I think it was the the magazine itself. Yeah, yeah. which had discovered so many writers. Um, and uh, they're still they do a lot of educational programs and and fostering young new voices here in the U.S. So that's great. But he really and he, he mentioned the dynamic from his standpoint as an editor that um, you know. They never had – each time they would have an open call or themes, um, th he never had a dearth of, of guys sending, sending writing. And even with women that they had published previously, he'd say, hey, you know, we, why don't you send me something? And again, I don't want to generalize, but it, he – from his experience, he said, you know, the women were sending in more polished work. But they never felt, not that they never felt it was good enough, but they, they felt that it needed more work. Whereas mm. guys a larger percentage raw. of guys yeah. had no problem saying, you know, oh, there's this thing I, you know, I, I, it's, it's still in draft, but have a look, you know, mm. which is, these are cultural dynamics. And, and it goes back to how 
how, you know, back to the nuclear family or what culture, how people are raised, you know, whether or not they feel like they have a seat at the table. Um, so it's to translate his experience as an editor. It's like he was bringing more seats to the table and asking people to come and sit front and center when they weren't used to. And that, I mean, they brought some great new voices, um, without his frankly activist work on saying, Hey, your work is great. I want more of it. My readers want more of it. It might not have happened. And that's where I think, uh, translators have real power. Publishers and editors do too. And, you know, the market that we exist in has its own dynamics, but, um, I think there are ways to stealthily change, change those dynamics so that we're getting new stories, new voices. Language you wish you had. Oh, a language I wish I had. Well, this is why I'm so grateful that there are other translators working from other languages. Sure. Last week, a friend of mine said that I needed to brand, I just needed to add more languages. And I thought that's the last thing in the world I would ever want to (laughs) do. You know, when I meet people and they find out I'm a translator and they say, oh, Italian and German into English. Um, Wow. And then, you know, my usual, I respond by, yeah, I'm still working on my English. I mean, (laughs) when... I learned a second a, a second language. It doubled the size of my world, quite literally. Um, I had all these new books, all these new authors, all these new people I could talk to. Adding a third, I, I mean, it's just, it's so much. I, I personally could never handle more than, yeah. than Italian and German into English. Um, I was. joke about adding Japanese for the Axis powers. Yeah, see, you have it all down. <laughs> but now. that's just a bad joke, yeah. and it's completely oh, it's okay. arbitrary. That's what we were discussing before you got here, whether it's okay for a Gentile to do a novel in German uh, filled mm-hmm. with jokes about Hitler. Um, Timur Vermes, actually, I don't know if you knew him, did mm-hmm. the uh, uh, Look Who's Back, where Hitler wakes up yeah. in, in modern-day Berlin. I moderated a panel at the Goethe Institute with him, uh, Gabriel Rosenfeld and Liesel Schillinger, who's mm-hmm. connected me to this whole crazy world. And, I think uh, I might have been in the audience at that yeah. panel. And you may remember the moment where I realized Timur actually isn't Jewish. And that was my, hey, wait a second. It's one thing for us to make jokes about Hitler. I'm yeah. not sure it's cool for a Gentile to make jokes about Hitler. And that, that led the conversation down a very different path. But Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so you can go with the Axis powers. I just got back from Japan, which is why we didn't shake hands earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a degree... It was an interesting phenomenon. I was there on a business trip, and one of the Japanese staff, she has pretty good English and could translate. There was an American who just got hired recently by the company who very fluent in Japanese. The problem was she was new to the industry completely that, that we were there for, mm-hmm. and so her translation could have been fine, but she didn't understand any of the terminology. The lingo and the terminology. Yeah, and what oh. it all meant. Whereas yeah. the other one understood all that stuff, but was more limited in her English to Japanese. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's um, yeah. challenges with translation. But I apropos guess. of Japanese, so Alison Markham Powell just won the Penn Translation Award for her translation of Hiromi Kawakami's uh, The Ten Loves of Nishino. Uh, I hope that's the 10 loves. Of, I can see the cover. <laughs> and it's a chip kid design. It always, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> is chip do, working for Europa now. <laughs> um, it's a very vibrant cover, but, mm. um, so I would not have known if she, if she and I hadn't been talking about, she's part of, you know, one of her groups that she works with in Japan is, um, strong women, soft power. It's, part, you know, one branch of the women in translation movement. I had no idea that until, um, you know, this is apparently no longer the case, but once upon a time, you would go into a Japanese bookstore and there would be, you know, science fiction, history, blah, 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 women's books. Um, Let me tell you, in one week there, the number of women who would step aside so I could get off the elevator first was really disconcerting. I was just like... I know I'm supposed to walk first because I'm the man, but let me tell you, that's really making me uncomfortable. And yeah. It's just, yeah. And that's not in a business environment. That's just, you know, in a hotel, mm-hmm. people I, I don't know, and they'll just, the, the Japanese women would wait for the, the men to get off the, the elevator. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I, you know, it never occurred to me that you would separate sections of a bookstore by the the gender of the author. Yeah. Um, but hey, so you still that's have work a... to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But last question, Chicago. Tell me about literary Chicago. And, literary Chicago and your, is your, amazing. Your literary ambassadorship. This is I did one with Urban Welsh a couple of years mm-hmm. ago. He was still living there, and he was just. He said, "New York, L.A." It's it's all competition," he said. In Chicago, I'm Irvin. I just get to to you know go to the movies, hang out with some writers, and, and mm. do my thing. But tell me about your literary Chicago. Literary Chicago blows me away. So I never thought I would leave New York. My my spouse is from Chicago, and that's why we moved there. I have met so many remarkable writers since I moved to Chicago, and it occurred to me. I thought I you know I knew a lot of writers in New York, and then I realized no. I, yeah, most of them were translators. <laughs> there are a lot of great translators in Chicago as well. Um, the indie bookstore scene is really thriving. Um, I've got a friend who works at The Dial who keeps telling me I have to come out there just to, it's to see the store. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, what can I say about it? I mean, I, because Chicago in many respects is still a foreign country to me, I set myself the goal of I'll read my way through its history. I mean, the, the city itself... I, it's kind of bewildering to me, the That's sheer it. amount of, well, it's very flat. Um, and until I read Ben Austin's High Risers about, um, what was it? The subtitle is Cabrini Green and the Fate of America, of Public Housing um, that came out a couple of years ago. I had first encountered that when it was in, I think, 2000. Eight or 2011 it was the cover story um from Har- on harper's magazine mm-hmm. and they had the the image on the cover was one of these high rises partially torn down and actually reminded me of the cover of david bellos's translation of george perak's life a user's manual mm-hmm. it was like a cutaway of a building yeah. so it's perak's uh, death day today i think Really? It might be his birthday. I forget. But it's an all over my oh, weird no literary idea. Twitter. It was like 1982. He died. Oh, wow. I think it's a... Uh, I'm a huge Perak fan, yeah. which means I'm a huge David Bellows fan He's ha- and several of his other translators. But It's just tough know. tweeting without the letter E, but, you know, I've been doing okay all day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that... So I, there you go. You know, a visual affiliation. But, you know, I got this because I subscribed to Harper's and I got this copy. And that article blew me away because it was really talking about... You know, public housing. Um, I, once again, I'm completely digressing from your question, but people had told me, oh yeah, if you see a, a hill in Chicago, it's a landfill. And I, and I thought this can't possibly be true. It's absolutely true. I mean, yeah. <laughs> any hills have been, are filled with either construction rubble or, um, Grad. yeah, it's, it's, but you know, so it's, it's got its Titans, you know, Nelson Algren and, uh, the jungle, uh, and lots of, so lots of contemporary writers, Rebecca Mackay. I mean, it, there's so much. Um, and I, so I still have zero understanding of the city. I think, um, you know, the extreme segregation that, you know, segregation exists in certain forms everywhere. We've talked about it in the literary world and translation with, you know, um, splits between, you know, underrepresentation, but, I mean, the history of redlining in that city, or, you know, I, I, some of my early translations for, for art and architecture publishers talk about, you know, urbanism and development and, um, it's, it's really mind boggling. So I set myself this mission of reading through the history of Chicago so I would understand it. And I'm, there's way more than a lifetime of, of work for me to read. And I don't know that I'm getting any better understanding of it, but um, I do know that it's a really vibrant city, and so there's this translation collective, the Third Coast Tran- TCTC, the Third Coast Translators Collective, um, and you know, so it's I've been blown away at how international it is. You know, um, New York is very international. The whole world is here. The whole world is in Chicago. It's just a little more spread out, <laughs> and it's. I mean, as a New Yorker, I without you know living in Chicago without a car, you can take the girl out of New York, but you can't take the New York out of the girl. Um, they're just different dynamics, right? Sure. So, um, and its its fame as a city of neighborhoods uh, is, is still very much true. Um, but you know, some great, just the lots of different languages and and exciting work and exciting presses mm-hmm. out there. 
Um, and the, one of the exciting things, actually, yeah. uh, for Festival Neue Literatur, so these these six authors are coming over from Austria, Liechtenstein, uh, Switzerland, and Germany. Um, they added Liechtenstein this year? Liechtenstein, yeah. Oh, geez, the the okay. Austrians kind of... Oh, they uh, get... I was going to bring up something about annexing it, but again, that, that's that's you know, Jewish history. I really don't want to go in that territory. So, yeah, yeah. that's a, a translation question. You know, when you talk about the Anschluss, do you talk about it as something being annexed, or do you just call it the Anschluss and capitalize it in English? Yeah. You know, so all these dynamics, it all comes through, and it all comes back to translation. Um, but anyway, you were saying about no, the, they the generously. Yeah. They, I think they they invited Liechtenstein to. Um, Gave them one of their spots, so uh, which is absolutely new this year. But the exciting thing is that all all six of these authors will be at Festival Neue Literatur in New York, and then they're splitting up, and they're sending three of them to Washington D.C. and three of them to Chicago um, through you know the local the local cultural institutes, and they'll be having events there, which is, it's just great. You know, I mean, once you cross the pond, you might as well make the most of it. And so, uh, I know the event in Chicago is called Literatur Lens, and I think the one in DC is called Zeitgeist. Um, but it's a way that, you know, of course it's, it's, it, to me, it's just an absolute miracle that, that FNL exists. It's, it's such a gift that these, the organizers are able to keep it going. And that and that people turn up for it. Um, and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm rambling on, but I do want to say that it's it's also very exciting that this the festival offers the opportunity, especially as co-curators, for us to invite two U.S. authors to pair mm -hmm. with with the foreign authors. And in some cases, the the visiting authors have been here. In some cases, they haven't. But to have this dialogue between a U.S. author. And um, so this year it's Helen Phillips and Joshua Cohen with with these foreign authors is, is just going to be very exciting, I think. You know, I've, I've never asked with the, the American authors they use, are they ones who have gone through the process of translation out of English into other languages? And does that even come up as part of their their? That's their interesting. Dialogue? It didn't come up at all. I know that Helen now Phillips has been... To, uh, yeah, yeah, I know that Helen Phillips has been translated. I'm almost certain she has into Russian, uh, into German. I know that um, she and I spoke about uh, her book, The Beautiful Bureaucrat, being translated into Italian a few years ago. Um, I also am almost 100% certain Joshua Cohen's been translated. You'd figure. Yeah. But... Yeah. Um, but it's not a, a make or break a criterion. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not one of the. So I won't do the the podcast in German at any point. So I don't have to worry about being. Oh, that's in. shada. Yeah. That's too bad. <laughs> I have occasional good pronunciation. I just can't understand anything I would possibly say. <laughs> Alta, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. And that was Alta L. Price. Check out her website, altalprice.com, to learn more about her work in translating, her consultancy, ALP Consulting, uh, the work she does with the Authors Guild and other nonprofits, and more. That's A-L-T-A-L-P-R-I-C-E. She's also on Instagram as Alta underscore L underscore Price. And, um, well, she has a LinkedIn account, if that's a thing that you do. I do, but not for podcast-related stuff. And even though this year's Festival Neue Literatur has been postponed until next year, you can find out more about the event, which Alta co-curated along with last week's guest, Tess Lewis, at festivalneuliteratur.com, or dot .org, sorry. Festival is spelled just like it is in English. Neu is N-E-U-E, and literatur is just literature without that final E. There's a link to it in the episode and show notes. And maybe I'll repost these conversations next April or do some follow-up ones with Tess and Alta about the year in between these recordings. I'm hopeful for the future and thankful both of them and FNL gave me the time. And after we wrapped, I asked Alta, so who you been reading? And if you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. 
The fourth quarter 2019 episode is up so supporters can listen to more than an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Chris Ware, Vitold Ripchinsky, Kate LaCour, Liz Hand, Frank Santoro, Hoche Anderson, Kevin Heisenga, Stephen Heller, Pete Bagg, Ed Ward, Annie Koyama, Rob Armstrong, Edie Nadelhaft, and Peter Cooper. I'll get working on that Q1 2020 episode sometime soon. That's sort of going to be the last pre-recorded stuff I ever put together before it is safe again for me to sit down with somebody and record in person. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod, but you don't have to. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that bonus podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, secret project that I talked about in the intro to um, one of the daily episodes last week, and more. So you can go to patreon.com slash vmspod and see how you can support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode and last week's at Tess Lewis's home in Bronxville, New York. I drove there from an orthopedist appointment. I seem to recall having a toll or two along the way, but I'm not going to bother looking up Easy Pass to see what they were. That was the before time. So, as I've been saying on the daily COVID check-in shows, um, I'm getting by okay, even with the added expenses of a remote recording service and increasing the monthly storage at my podcast host to accommodate all those daily episodes. So, um, that's offset by no longer having tolls, parking, coffee, uh, subway trips, etc. for all of those in-person episodes. What I mean is, if you have money to spare... Don't put it in my Patreon unless you really want access to those Fear of a Square Planet bonus shows, in which case email me. We'll talk about it. Um, go give money to other people's Patreons, GoFundMes, Kickstarters, Indiegogos, tip jars, whatever. Uh, donate to charities, maybe kick into your local food bank. If you have something to spare, do something good for someone else. A lot of people and institutions are in need right now. I'm doing okay. So help where you can. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going.